family of faith to worship and praise him. I invite you to stand for opening hymn number 728. worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This time we invited a kneel sitter stand for a time of silent reflection and self-examination. We confess together, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand as we join together reading the psalm of the day, which comes from Psalm chapter 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, 
and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The just decrees of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. We join together in singing the Kyrie. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The Old Testament reading is taken from Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. 
And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and, re and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Now join together confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Maybe see as we join together in singing hymn number 824.
I invite you to open a Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we look at what is the point of church, what is the focus of our faith, and the answer being it is Jesus Christ alone. As we go to God's word this morning, we begin by going to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would make them still, give them a peace that goes beyond understanding, and hearts to receive God's word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Holy Spirit would open the scriptures to both their hearts and minds that they would receive the gospel of Jesus this morning. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So how many of you think Jesus is nice? Just a question, right? If, you were, if I were to ask you, come up with a list of adjectives for Jesus Christ, I'm assuming that nice and kind and gentle would be on that list somewhere, probably near the top, because as Christians, what do we know about Jesus? He loves us, Right? And he loves us with a perfect love. And so we go, of course he's kind. Of course he's patient, especially patient with us who are his followers that get it wrong sometimes and come up short sometimes and sin sometimes. Yet he still forgives us and shows us grace. Yet in our gospel reading this morning, we see not such a nice Jesus. Now to put it in context, this is Passover week for them. So this is the biggest celebration of the year for the Jewish people. This is Easter weekend, okay? Now imagine on Easter Sunday, you come in to worship, you got your beautiful clothes on, there's flowers here, I know, sorry, there's no Easter lilies because I'll die from them, I'm sorry about that, but there's other beautiful flowers and, and everything's decorated, everybody's ready to celebrate, and then as you're coming in, instead of being handed a bulletin, I make a whip and start chasing you around the sanctuary until you leave. How many of you are going to be like, he is risen indeed, hallelujah? <laughs> or how many of you are going to be just thoroughly confused and Pastor Mark has lost his mind? Right? Okay, this is what happened. This is what Jesus did. It's the biggest celebration of the year. It's Passover, and they gather together, and he goes to the temple where the sacrifices are to be made, where the utmost uh, respect and honor and worship of God is to be done. And he makes a whip and he chases people out because they've missed the whole point of the worship. They've turned it into something else. Instead of being a moment to worship God and to invite others to worship God and have their sins forgiven, which was the whole point of Passover, they've gathered together and they've made it into rituals and traditions that they came up with. And most importantly and most grievously to Jesus is this. They've turned it into an economic Um, process. The whole point had become, let's make as much money out of people as we possibly can, rather than making it a house of prayer and worship for God's people. Now, I know what you're thinking is like, well, Pastor Mark's not going to do that to us, and I'm not. I'm not going to chase you around with a whip and, and scare you like that, okay? But here's what I want you to think about. Jesus chases them out of the temple because they miss the main point of worship, So we have to do some self-reflection. We have to do some self-examination as we do when we do our confession and absolution of are there times where I make other things the main point of worship rather than Jesus Christ? Now the right answer is always to say Jesus, right? Everybody's in church, you're in Sunday school, you've learned that the right answer is just when in doubt, say Jesus, and that's the right answer. We we know we're supposed to make Jesus the main point. But in a moment of self-reflection and self-examination, a moment of confession, are there times in your life when you make anything else the main point of your worship or your faith or your walk with Jesus, other than Jesus himself? And the answer, unfortunately, for all of our hearts is yeah. We might not be setting up money-changing tables and charging people to come into worship, 
But there are idols, there are things that get in the way of making Jesus the main point of our worship and our faith. So if you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to see Paul address this. Now here's the interesting thing about Corinthians. It covers so much stuff. It covers idolatry, it covers food, it covers sexuality, it covers marriage, it covers what we are to do with our money. So everything you can think of under the sun, all the practical things of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in the world, give me some practical insights, Corinthians has it. Yet despite the fact that Paul will write about all those aspects of life in the book of Corinthians, the thing that he makes of first and utmost importance is two things. One is at the beginning of the book he says, Christ died on the cross. And at the end of the book, he says, Christ rose from the dead. And he's making the point that these are the most important truths, despite everything else in life that our faith impacts, that if we don't get Jesus on the cross, we don't get Jesus rising from the dead, we get our faith wrong. All right, so if you go back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to verse 10, it's a little bit before our scripture reading, He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is essentially saying, I'm appealing by the highest authority we possibly can. For goodness sake, would you please stop doing what you're doing? Okay, so he's saying, I'm appealing to you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers and sisters. Right, you've ever had a fight with another Christian, you know, another disagreement, I think we should do it this way, no, I think this way is better. Anybody wanna raise their hand on that one? No? <laughs> right, we make our thing the main thing rather than Jesus, and all of a sudden we start having divisions and quarreling within the church, and within our faith. And so Paul's saying this is a problem, and here's what they're fighting about. In verse 12, he says, what I mean is this, that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, who is Peter, or I follow Jesus Christ. They're essentially having a fight over who is your favorite pastor, who's your favorite preacher, who's your favorite author, who's your favorite theologian, and then they're having a fight that if you follow this one, you're a better type of Christian. No, if you follow this guy, you're a better type of Christian. And Paul's gonna say this in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? These are all rhetorical questions, and the answer being to all of them is no, absolutely not. Christ is not divided. Paul was not on the cross, and you were not baptized into the name of Paul, but you were baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. So what's Paul getting at? Well, what he's getting at is he'll say in chapter two is that Apollos and Paul's names count for nothing. Only the name of Jesus matters. Right, we live in a day and age where we still have the temptation to divide ourselves. Right, because of the internet, there is so much access to information reading material, teaching, and podcasts, and all kinds of things that we can very easily start to say, I follow this way of thinking, no, I follow this way of thinking, or I follow this person, this person's my hero, this person's my hero, or this person's my favorite, right? Unless it's me, that's bad, right? Now, if I'm your favorite, it's totally cool, all right? But not really, though, right? Because who started the church in Corinth? It was Paul. And even though some people are saying, oh, we follow Paul, his whole point was his name, the name of Paul, counts for nothing. And then later on in Corinthians, he'll say, imitate me in so far as I imitate Christ. He was saying the only thing that matters about Paul is that Paul points you to Jesus Christ. The only thing that matters about Pastor Mark is so far as I point you to Jesus Christ through his word. Other than that, my opinions don't really matter. They don't count for anything. They're not biblical, okay? The only thing that matters is pointing people to Jesus Christ. And so Paul says all this, and he's asking these questions, because as human beings, we have a tendency to be like the money changers in the temple and to make everything about our faith and our worship but Jesus Christ. To confuse it and to mix it in and say, no, 
It's about Jesus a little bit, but really what matters to me is this. Right now, I grew up in something that was called the worship wars of the 90s and early 2000s, which is a great way to attract people to Jesus. Say you're having a war in the church. You're like, you wanna come with us and join our side? All right? Now, what the worship wars were all about was what style of worship is best? Now, I'm not gonna do a show of hands on this, but I will ask you a question. How many of you have a preference on worship style, hymnal that might be used, hymns that are sung, liturgy that is used? Any, let's just all raise our hand and be honest. This is a time to be honest. You got a preference, okay? It's okay to have a preference. Martin Luther even said it was okay to have a preference as long as you don't turn your preference into a law for everybody else and say it must be done this way. The only part of worship that must be done this way is that we make it all about Jesus. Because if we don't make it all about Jesus, nobody gets saved. That's what Paul is getting at. When he asked the question, is Christ divided, was Paul crucified for you? Who was crucified for you? Jesus. He's your savior. So without making it about him, we are in big trouble, not just for ourselves, but for the world, because what are we inviting them to if not to be saved by Jesus? Because if we don't make church and worship and our faith about Jesus, we have nothing to invite people to. Because I'm not gonna save them. You didn't die for their sins. You didn't rise from the dead for them. Only Jesus did. So Paul continues, we're gonna jump down to verse 18. And he says, here's why we gotta make it all about Jesus even if it doesn't seem appealing. For the word of cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the first thing that we see is that, look, Paul's like, we've gotta make it all about Jesus. And one of the things that is important is to understand who he's writing to. He's writing to the church in Corinth, which was a major metropolitan city with all kinds of people that valued power and wisdom and intelligence. It was a huge metropolis that people from all over the world traveled to and from to do business there. And so everybody was focused on it's all about power, it's all about wealth, it's all about seeming wise in the eyes of the world. And Paul says, okay, well, great, but here's our message. Jesus died and Jesus rose again. Now, from a human perspective, your, your question would be, well, what else do you have? Because they're worried about their jobs, they're worried about their income, they're worried about politics, they're worried about power and influence. I mean, things that we don't care about anymore as human beings, right? No, it's exactly the same stuff that the world still cares about. And the temptation is to go, okay, well, we're gonna look like the world, we're gonna behave like the world, we're gonna speak and think like the world, because that'll draw them in. And Paul goes, well, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. In other words, saying it is, the word of cross is dumb to those who don't believe. They're gonna mock it. Just like people mocked Christ when he was on the cross, Paul's saying people are still gonna mock and make fun of the message of the gospel and think that it's ludicrous and ridiculous unless they believe in its power. So if you are one of those people that thinks the world's getting worse, right? Some people think the world's getting better, the world's getting worse. Um, I've read research on it. It depends on how old you are. The older you get, the worse you think the world's getting get. The younger you are, the better you think the world's getting. So it's more so it's just an age thing, all right? But we could fight about that as generations, okay? <laughs> but if you think, oh, the world's getting worse, if people don't believe in Jesus, they don't understand the gospel, they don't value the message of the cross, I got news for you. Nothing's changed. Paul says, the word of cross is folly to those who are perishing. And he wrote that in Bible times. Everybody always goes, I want to go back to the Bible times. What that tells me is you've never read the Bible. Because they had the same problems back then, and sometimes even worse. Because they were still figuring it out. But Paul's saying, look, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Yet to those who are being saved is the power of God. So he goes down to verse 22. He says, the Jews demand signs and the Greeks or the Gentiles seek wisdom. 
What is Paul getting at? He's saying, well, the Jews want a big sign, a show of God's miraculous power that Jesus is the Christ. And our response as Christians would be like, well, he raised him from the dead. That's pretty great. And then the Greeks want wisdom. They want philosophy. They want you to make the cross make sense. And Paul says, well, they want signs and they want wisdom, but it's foolishness to both. And he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly or foolishness to Gentiles. But we preach Christ crucified. One of the things that pastors don't usually do is tell you how to judge pastors, how to evaluate us. Here's how to evaluate my preaching. Did I preach Christ crucified or not? All right, now hopefully I do, that's my job. But if I don't, you have a responsibility as a church to come to me and say, that was a bad sermon. Right, not because it entertained you or didn't entertain you or my stories were funny or moving or whatever, but was Jesus at the center of it? Because if Jesus isn't at the center of it, there's no point. It's just a talk. But what gives it power is the cross. In Romans chapter one, Paul says that the power of the gospel is the power of salvation for both Jews and Greeks, for both Jews and Gentiles. Essentially saying the power of the gospel is salvation for all people who believe in it. Now here's the struggle we have. Here's the convicting point that I have for myself and for Christians is we are afraid to share the gospel. Sometimes it's because we're afraid how people react. They're gonna think it's foolishness. They're gonna mock it. They're gonna make fun of you. I got news for you. They were doing that in the Bible times too, all right? So nothing's changed. But sometimes I think we are afraid to share the gospel because we are we are afraid that it isn't powerful enough to change lives, all right? Now that's a hard truth, but Romans one says the power of the gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe. Paul's saying, look, these people over here want miraculous signs, these people over here want philosophy and wisdom and worldly thought, and yet in the middle what we're doing is we're preaching Christ crucified, and he says in verse 24, but those who are called both Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And so he's saying people are saved from both groups of people. Both Jews and Gentiles are being saved because of the message of the cross. And Paul would go even further in his writings to say they're only being saved because of the message of the cross. But we're afraid to share the gospel sometimes, I think, because we're afraid that it's not powerful enough to change lives. We think, well, we've gotta be more creative, we've gotta be more interesting, we've gotta be more appealing, we've gotta do this thing or that thing. And we forget that the one thing that brings salvation is what? The gospel. Jesus died on the cross, Jesus rose again from the dead. I remember when my Aunt Tracy died at 41, and we were all gathered together as a family for the funeral. And then, of course, afterwards we had the meal and the time together as a family and people are grieving and we're all upset. And one of my uncles came up to me because my brother and I are pastors, so people were coming up to us going, what you got for us? You're gonna fix this, right? And that's what my uncle asked me. One of my uncles came up to me and goes, he, he, he's crying because his baby sister has passed away at 41. And he's like, what do you got for me, Mark? And I'm sitting there crying like, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, I'm devastated, I'm crying too. What do you mean, what do I got? And he's like, well, what do you got for me? What, what do you got that will comfort me? Like, what happened to Tracy? And I said, well, she, before she died, she confessed her faith in Jesus to my brother. She declared that she believed in him. Her sins were forgiven. Jesus died on the cross for her. Jesus rose again. And he, she's in heaven. And one day, he's gonna raise her from the dead. My uncle looked at me and goes, is that really all you got? And I was like, yeah, that's all I got. Here's the reality that Paul is getting at. It's all any of us have. If you want salvation, if you want comfort and hope for eternal life, the only way is Jesus Christ. The only way is the cross and the resurrection of Christ. And the only hope people like my uncle have, even though he was struggling with it, the only hope that people you work with and live with and are neighbors with have is Jesus Christ on the cross and him rising from the dead. 
There is no other hope of salvation. The book of Acts declares there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved than that of Jesus Christ. Romans 10 talks about how we are saved by hearing the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and believing with our hearts in it. But Romans 10 also asks the question, how are they gonna believe if no one ever shares the word of God with them? People aren't saved through osmosis, y'all. They're not saved by you just being nice. They're saved by the cross of Jesus Christ. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, whether they want signs and miracles or whether they want worldly wisdom or philosophy, it doesn't matter. They're only saved, Paul says, through Jesus Christ, which is why he says, but we, in verse 23, and to me, the most important word in verse 23 is the word we. He doesn't say I, and we go, okay, it's up to Paul. He says we, writing to the church collectively. So who's the we here? Us, it's all y'all, right? He says we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to Jews and it's falling to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then at the end of the chapter, in verse 29 says, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The only thing that we boast about as Christians to the world is how great our Jesus is. Because that's all you got. The only reason you're saved, the only reason you're forgiven, the only reason you're redeemed and restored and made new, the only reason you get to call yourself a Christian is because Jesus did all the work on the cross to forgive your sins and redeem you. So the thing that we boast about, as Paul would say in his other letters, is we boast about Jesus Christ, not ourselves. So you don't go around going, I'm awesome. Nobody likes, anybody work with anybody that's arrogant? Been around someone that's arrogant and you go, boy, they're pleasant. I love being around them. No, they drive you insane, right? Don't be an arrogant Christian. Don't drive people insane by being an arrogant Christian going, it's all about me and look how great I am. I am so much better than you. That's called moralism. It's called legalism. What Paul says to boast in is, I boast in Christ Jesus and what he has done. So when people ask you about your faith, you go, I'm just gonna talk about Jesus. I'm gonna talk about who he is and what he's done. It's not about you, it's not about me. It becomes all about Jesus Christ. And in verse 30, he concludes, he says, because of him, so because of who? Jesus, right? We're in church, just say Jesus. It's the right answer most of the time. Because of Jesus, you are in Christ Jesus. Because of him, he became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in who? The Lord. But I want you to see in verse 30, he says, Jesus is your righteousness, your sanctification, and your redemption. What is he saying about Jesus? He's your everything. He is why you are righteous before God. He is your redemption. He is why you are saved from your sins. And he is your sanctification, meaning he is why you are getting better and becoming more like him each and every day. Because the Holy Spirit is at work in your life and Jesus is at work in your life through the gospel, through the Holy Spirit to make you more like him. So the only thing you ever have to brag about to anybody else in the world, whether it's a Christian or non-Christian, is Jesus is really awesome. He has redeemed me, he has forgiven me, he has saved me, and he's made me new. He's made me more and more like him each and every day. So when people ask like, well how'd you get that way? How do you pray more? How do you read your Bible more? How are you more kind, right? Remember in Galatians chapter five, Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. How did you become more gentle and patient and kind and loving and good? You don't sit down and go, let, let me tell you. It was a lot of hard work on my part. I had to put up with a lot of morons that made me patient. Right? I had to put up with a bunch of jerks that made me kind and gentle because I had to forgive them. No, you say, let me tell you. Jesus is at work in my life. He's the one that is making me new each and every day. He's the one who has forgiven me and redeemed me and is sanctifying me. So dear friends, the only hope you and I have is Jesus Christ. 
He's the whole point of our faith. He's the whole center and purpose of our worship. And just as importantly, he's the only hope the rest of the world has, whether they are Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter what their struggle is. It doesn't matter what their background is. It doesn't matter what their nationality is. The only hope that they have is Jesus Christ and his cross and his resurrection. So here's my plea for you. Just like Paul pleaded earlier in Corinthians, that we would preach Christ crucified. That when we go out into the world, we would remember that the whole point of Christianity is Jesus on the cross and Jesus rising from the dead. And that when we wanna give people hope in the world, we would say, Jesus died to forgive your sins. And Jesus rose to give you new life here and now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the center and focus of our faith. May we be faithful to you each and every day, faithful to focus on you in our hearts and minds and in our lives and in our worship. May we remember that our whole lives are about you. Our whole faith is about you and your work on the cross. And as we go into the world, may we share the hope of your cross and resurrection with the people, trusting that it is the power and the only power of salvation for all who hear it. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we go to our God in prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That our God would save the third and fourth generations who will come after us from his punishment. Let us pray to the Lord. For zeal this Lent, that following Christ we may cast every idol from our hearts and be devoted to him alone. Let us pray to the Lord. For the continued proclamation of the cross's power, that from this life-giving tree we would receive the gifts that preserve faith. Let us pray to the Lord. That the Lord of the perfect law would bless all who govern us, that he would make them wise in his ways and uphold justice, and that he would help us serve and obey them in accordance with his will. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who suffer in our midst, that the flood may not sweep over them, nor the pit close its mouth on them, and that God would deliver them in his steadfast love, granting them healing, comfort, and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. That our Redeemer would declare us innocent in Christ of all hidden faults and keep us back from presumptuous sins. Let us pray to the Lord. That our God, whose true temple was destroyed by wicked men, yet raised up again after three days, will grant us and all the saints to share in his glory of his son's resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings.
Please stand for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally, because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying... Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. Please stand as we join together and sing the Nook Dominus. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you refreshed us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.